But we found that when Americans joined the church or some people who are born here and grew up here and they did not understand or they don't understand Arabic and they don't understand uh, a Coptic. So their attendance, uh, they stumble when they attend with three languages because they feel confused when Abuna or the deacon switch from one language to another language to another language. And St. Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 spoke about the importance of praying with understanding. And he said five words with understanding better than 10,000 words without understanding. Even at the time there was the gift of speaking in tongues. And St. Paul made it Kirill if there is no interpretation, let him be silent in the church. That's why in order to uh, serve our youth who don't understand Arabic and who don't understand Coptic, in order to serve them well, also in order to serve the Americans who converted to Orthodoxy and joined our church, so we started to develop what we call American Coptic Orthodox churches. So the main difference between American Coptic and regular Coptic is the culture. For example, here we pray everything in English. So people will not be confused if I'm American, I'm attending this church, I will not be confused when uh, Abuna or the deacon switch from language to another language. So the American Coptic or the church pray only in uh, pray only in English. But in other churches, if you are interested to uh, to pray with different language than English, there are other churches. So in each area, like in Florida, in the south, we have St. Luke. But there are other churches that pray Coptic and, and Arabic and English like St. Mary, like St. John the Baptist, like then St. Peter. These churches pray with different languages. Another church we have in Orlando, and another church we have it in the west side of Florida, St. Macarius American Coptic Orthodox Church in Tampa Clearwater area. So in Florida we have three churches, American Coptic, St. Luke here in the south, St. Athanasius in, um, in Orlando, central Florida, and San Macarius in Western Florida, Tampa Clearwater area. But in all these areas, there are churches that pray in Arabic, pray in English, and pray also in Coptic. How can we beat temptations from the devil? Uh, at least there are four things you need to keep in your mind in order to overcome temptation. Uh, number one, keep your mind holy. Because Satan, the mind, is a battlefield. Any, any temptation starts here as an idea in your mind. And Satan actually tried to plant this idea in your mind, try to deceive you and to make you believe a lie. That's why when I keep my mind holy and I check every idea against the truth in the scripture, Satan cannot actually play with my mind. The technique of Satan, number one, he deceives me. Number two, he tempts me. Number three, he accuses me. And these are the three titles of the de devil. The deceiver, the tempter, the accuser. These are biblical titles. Deceiving will make you believe a lie. How he deceived our mother Eve. He made her believe that if she eats from the forbidden tree, she will be similar to God. 
she made her believe that God doesn't want her best interest. When he told her, God knows, God told you don't eat from it because God knows if you eat from it, you will be similar to God. So when I know the truth, the truth will set me free. Meaning what? When Satan tried to make me believe a lie, I know what's right. So number one in overcoming temptation, scripture and knowing the truth of the scripture. This will guard you from the temptation. Satan cannot deceive you, cannot make you believe a lie. Number two, I told you he deceives, then he tempts you. Tempts you. Tempts you make the sin pleasurable and acceptable. Pleasurable and acceptable. Uh, Sorry, not acceptable. Accessible, I'm sorry. Make the sin pleasurable and accessible. Easy to access. Like how he made the fruit looks pleasurable in the eyes of Eve and it is accessible to her. Ask people who smoke or, or, dr- or use drugs. Ask them, first drug or first cigarette, how much they pay for it? They will tell you nothing. They get it for free. That's how Satan tempts us. That's why the Lord told us, pray and be watchful lest you fall into temptation. Pray and be watchful. Satan will set traps to catch us. That's why we need to be watchful for these traps. And we should not flirt with sin. I shall not say, you know, I will try this, but I know I will never uh, be addicted to it. I will try a cigarette, but I, I know I will never be a smoker. No, you are lying to yourself. And Satan is deceiving you. So be watchful. And when the temptation, when you feel you are attracted to something sinful, pray, call for the name of Christ. The name of Christ is strong and can help you and can cast out demon. Renounce Satan in the name of Christ. I renounce you, Satan, in the name of Christ. Pray and watch lest you fall into temptation. Number three, you need to develop self-control to say no to the temptation. For example, you are fasting and somebody offered you non-fasting food and you love this food. So you need to to have strong will, self-control to be able to say no to the temptation. If you are tempted to take something not yours, money not yours, you need to be able to say no. How can I commit this great wickedness and sin against God? And that's why one of the main purposes of fasting is to develop self-control. Why the church encourage us to fast? Because fasting will help us to develop self-control, to say no to the temptation. And finally, the fourth point, if, God forbid, you fall into temptation, repent immediately. Rise up and repent immediately. Don't continue, but immediate repentance after you fall. So these are the four things how to overcome temptation. Number one, the truth of the scripture in order for Satan not to deceive you. Number two, pray and watch, lest you fall into temptation. Number three, develop self-control to be able to say no to something pleasurable and accessible. And number four, God forbid, if you fall, then repent immediately. Don't continue in this sinful life. Uh, The following question, why can't Orthodox Christian date? Uh, no, Orthodox Christian can date. Who said they cannot? But they can date when they are ready for marriage. 
That's why we need to agree on the definition of dating. What do you mean by dating? If dating is friendship between high schoolers, boy and girl, 15 years old, okay, how can you define this relationship or this friendship one on one? Why don't you be friend with all the boys and girls in your age? Why you want to develop one to one relationship? And is this one to one relationship uh, uh, will have emotions or not? And what if one person is controlling his emotion but the second cannot? And this is like a slippery slope. It starts by friendship and ends by sin. That's why dating when you are ready to get married. Dating means it is a special one-on-one friendship in order to get married. So don't say, yes, I, I, I'm choosing this person, I, I will marry her, but after I finish college, and you are still in high school. People who start dating in high school, actually, they date different people, maybe four, five, seven, eight, until they get married. And with every time, they date and break up, and date and break up, and date and break up. Besides the, the, the sinful and lustful sins included, uh, every breakup actually affect the, uh, the emotional health of the person. And then the person get used to date and break up. So when they get married, people will be easy to divorce because he went through eight breaks up before. So it will be easy for him to break up again. Very rare, almost zero, almost zero percent for a date who started like in high school and continued until they get married and they had happy marriage after, uh, after this. Almost zero. So if you are in high school or college, get to know all the boys and girls in a Christian way, make all of them your friends. Then when you are ready for marriage and you are spiritually mature, physically mature, educationally mature, socially mature, financially mature, ready for to, to, to get married, here you can start one-to-one relationship uh, followed by engagement, followed by uh, the wedding. Uh, another question, can you be friends with someone who is homosexual? Uh, first, I like to differentiate between two types of homosexuals. A person who is defending homosexuality as alternative lifestyle. They say it is alternative lifestyle. Uh, and defend, and they don't see it, it is sin. And people, this, that's one type. Second type, people know homosexuality is sin, and they are struggling to live life of repentance and holy life. Like anybody uh, struggling with any sin, sins of the tongue, sins of uh, sexual desire, in, in any sin. So the first type who actually don't see it sinful and defend it as an alternative lifestyle, you need to keep distance from them. Because as St. Paul said, bad company corrupt good morals. They will influ- influence you in a negative way. Pray for them. If, you, if they are your companion in school or, or uh, work, they are your companion. Deal with them with respect. Yes, respect them. But to be close and to be friends to them, no. 
No, because St. Paul said there is no fellowship between light and darkness, between children of God and children of Belial. There is no fellowship. How, how you make yourself a close friend to somebody who is actually saying about something sinful is, is right, is good. Two different standards here. As for uh, the second type, if, if a person is struggling, with like, like all of us who are struggling, who among us not struggling with any sin? All of us who are struggling with different sins. So if a person knows it is sinful and, and living life of repentance, know it is wrong, confessing it, repenting it, you know, then uh, all of us, we, we need to support one another in order to live holy and godly life. And you in your spiritual struggle, you need support. The other person in his spiritual struggle needs support. So we need to be supportive to each other. Why should I confess to the priests, not to God directly? What is the reference in Old Testament and New Testament? First, let me explain why, and then I will tell you about the references. In treating addiction, they try it different ways. And they found that the most effective way in treating any addiction is the support group, like alcohol anonymous, like narcotic anonymous, etc. Why? Because in support group, uh, people hold me accountable. I'm account accountable to all these people. And also, they support me. And besides this, when I admit and I say I am addict and I'm trying to be sober now, I'm sober for 10 days, for two weeks, or whatever, taking responsibility of my addiction make me, I'm not blaming it on anybody. I'm taking full responsibility. So as, as I'm taking full responsibility, this will help me to take also full responsibility in recovery. Why I'm, I'm speaking about addiction? I want to tell you that to overcome any sin, and sin is addictive by nature, any sin is addictive. When you curse or you swear or you lie, once you do it as a nature, then it's, uh, it became addictive. You are uh, addicted to lying, addicted to cursing, addicting to swearing, addicting to judging. So in order to overcome this, there has to be at least the three things. Number one, sense of responsibility. Number two, accountability. Number three, support. And you cannot do this by yourself. That's why I need to speak to another person. The other person here in the confession is my father of confession. So the purpose of confession is not only just to say a list of my sins, but to take full responsibility before Abuna, I am responsible of this sin and I have no excuse. Then Abuna will hold me accountable, which help me in overcoming this sin. And number three, Abuna will support me. Even in Protestant churches right now, who do not believe in the sacrament of confession. There is now in Protestant churches what they call it accountability groups. And the accountability group, I go there, I tell them I have problem with anger. So here I'm taking responsibility. They are supporting me, holding me accountable. That's why for our benefit, he told us, you need actually to confess to a person, 
like you so I can be held accountable, I get support, and I show responsibility. Besides in the sacrament of confession, besides these three things, there is the power of the Holy Spirit. Because confession is a sacrament. The power of the Holy Spirit to forgive my sins and to lose the bonds of the sin. As the Lord said to the disciples, you can find it in John chapter 20, and he breathed into the face of his holy disciples and sent the apostles and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. So here actually God giving, why God gives them this authority to forgive sins and to retain sins unless people will confess to them, to the, to, to, to the clergy. You know, so besides the three things in this sacrament, Abuna with the authority of the Holy Spirit, he forgives your sins and also lose the bonds of sin. If, son, if the sin is binding me, these bonds are loosed. So it is for our benefit to confess to Abuna. I can stand before God and I tell him, God, I killed, I committed adultery, I stole money, I, you know, I can just say it easily. But when there is accountability, there is support, there is guidance. Part of the support guidance. Abuna knows. You, you don't go to a book of um, medicine and you read about your illness and get the treatment and you treat yourself. Even when a physician gets sick, he goes to another physician. He doesn't treat himself. About references from Old Testament and New Testament, in the Old Testament there are two sacrifices, one called trespass sacrifice and sin sacrifice, in which the person goes and puts his hand on the head of sacrifice and confesses his sins. So his sins are uh, moved from the person to this sacrifice. Then they kill the sacrifice instead of the person. Of course, this was a symbol of the sacrifice of Christ. But the idea of confessing their sins, it was there. They put their hand on the head of the sacrifice and they confess their, confessed their sins. In John the Baptist, when you read in Matthew chapter 3, many people, it's written in Matthew, went to him confessing their sins, confessing their sins. And as I told you, on the day of resurrection, the Lord appeared to the disciples and told them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Why he gave them this authority of forgiving sins unless they're going to practice it? Also in Acts, in the book of Acts, uh, chapter 19 and verse 18, we read, and many of those who believed went to the apostles confessing their sins. Those who believed went to the apostles confessing their sins. That is in uh, Acts 19, verse 18. In James chapter 5, uh, St. James says, if anyone is sick, let him call for the priests of the church. They pray over him, anoint him with oil. If he committed any sin, will be forgiven. Then he said, confess your trespasses to one another. So after he said, if you committed any sin, it will be forgiven. He said, confess your trespasses to one another. As if he is saying this, uh, this forgiveness of sin is through confession. Some Protestants, they interpret this verse well, like, no, no. When um, the, he said, confess your sins to one another, means if I sin against you, I come, oh, look, I'm sorry, just tell you I'm sorry. That's confessing. But St. John Chrysostom and St. Augustine, when they interpreted this verse, he said, or they said, 
if I tell you treat one another, means the physician treats the patient, not the opposite. If I tell you teach one another, means the teacher will teach the student, not the student teach the teacher, and so on. So when St. Paul said, conf St. James said, confess your trespasses to one another, means we confess to the clergy. It doesn't mean just to confess to lay person, because the lay person did not receive the, this authority to forgive sins and to lose sins and to bind sins. As the Lord said, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This authority was given to the clergy. And there are many verses, like in St. John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive our sins. Uh, so those who practiced confession, they know how it is very beneficial, uh, as if there is a huge burden is taken off your shoulder, the guidance, the support, the accountability will help the person to overcome the sins. I finished all the questions in front of me, if you have any more questions. Yes. It depends where he is, meaning is he uh, believing in God or he's an atheist? If he uh, believing in God, does he follow any religion or not? And this religion is Christian or non-Christian? And if he's Christian, which denomination he is following? Why I'm saying this? There is a way to address like atheist different than if addressing a person who non-Christian or a person who is Christian but from different background like Protestant or Catholic, etc. That's why in theological seminary we teach comparative religion and comparative um, theology. Comparative religion, different between different religions like Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, etc. Comparative theology, different between, difference between different denominations, like Protestant Catholicism, etc. So, and there is a way to address each one. For example, if you address an atheist, he cannot use the Bible, because he does not believe in the Bible. St. Paul, when he used to go to synagogues of the Jews, he used Old Testament to convince them. But when he went to Athens, and people were pagans worshiping idols, he did not use one word from the Old Testament, but he used the logic in order to convince them that there is God, and God sent his son Jesus Christ, etc. So it depends what is the background of your friend, and based on the background, there is a way to address the atheist, non-Christian, Christian from different backgrounds. Any more questions? 